flowering leaves of all these life-giving trees that flow in the breeze, giving us the air to breathe, came from the seeds that sons and daughters had sown, passing down histories through stories, genes, and bones. Hear the whispers of the past dictate your prologue, a generational trio through which memories are prolonged. So we reach down like nourishing waters to seek truths, except we receive nourishment when we're digging the roots. Good evening, everybody. We are so glad that you could join us on this Wednesday evening. Tonight is the latest episode of Black Pro Gen Live. And you know what? If you are tuning in, you're watching one of the last three left for 2017. I cannot believe that this year is over. It went by so fast, but regardless, we are so glad that you are joining us tonight. And if you've joined us before, we thank you so much for joining us. Previously, we've got a, a really good topic to discuss tonight. And uh, there's a lot of chatters, a lot of folks viewing. We've got a great panel. It's a little intimate one, but the topic is needed. And of course, we can't, we can't discriminate against parts of the United States. So what are we talking about tonight? Tonight's topic is people of color in the Northeast, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Learn tips, tricks, resources, and more for genealogy research in those states on this episode this evening. Before we get started really good, we wanna remind you to be sure to join the conversation with us tonight. If there's something that you find that's interesting that we say or that one of the panelists talks about, feel free to tweet us at Black Progen or hashtag any of your comments with Black Progen. Also, if you're watching live on YouTube, there is a live chat taking place and it's happening at the top right hand corner of your screen if you're watching on a computer or at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Be sure to let us know that you're out there and that you are listening and you are enjoying yourself or maybe we said something crazy and you're like, you know, I need to let them know they're wrong. Ha, this is the area that you would do that. So feel free to join the conversation tonight. Don't forget to set your reminders. Have you been like, man, I missed that show. I cannot believe it. Be sure to set your reminders. All you need to do is head to my YouTube page and click set reminder under the episode you're interested in or simply subscribe to the channel and you'll get a reminder each and every time we go live. And as I mentioned, we only have two other shows left for this month or this year, really. So go ahead, set those reminders for those last two. And as we get the schedule firmed up for 2018, you'll see me adding new shows to the live stream area. New announcement tonight. Who doesn't like free stuff? I love free 99. Have you ever wanted to attend Roots Tech? Well, here is your chance to go. Care of Black Progen Live. Every person that submits a case to Ask Mariah for the month of November will be automatically entered for a chance to win a free four day pass to the conference being held February 28th to March 3rd, 2018 at the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City, Utah. Choose from 100 plus classes on genealogy as well as have access to one of the largest genealogy exhibit halls in the world with your favorite vendors to boot. Be sure to check the description of this and any Black Pro Gen Life episode for the link to submit your case for Ask Mariah and you may be just the person who wins the four day Roots Tech Pass. All right, I'm Nika Smith. I'm here in good old West Tennessee. We've got our panelists here for the evening. Feel free to unmute yourselves, ladies, since we are Y chromosome deficient tonight. Our <laughs> usual <laughs> our usual Y chromosome, James, is actually, let's see. He's he on his way. Yes, yeah, I was gonna is say he, he should there? be on the ground by now. James yeah. is on his way to Nigeria. He's actually on a ancestry trip to Nigeria. So Amazing. he will not be here probably for the next two episodes, <laughs> I'm I'm assuming. Um, I don't know where Willie is and I think Alex is probably gonna join us later. So let's go ahead and get started with our usuals, Ellen Fernandez Sacco. Hi everybody, it's Ellen Fernandez Sacco, latinogenealogy.com. I'm gonna have a new site somewhat soon and I'm um, really happy to be here. All right. It looks like Angela Walton Raji is joining us. She's going to be yes. in red, probably. I don't think yes. she has any other color in her in her <laughs> wardrobe. 
She's got red on. She's wearing red. Ooh. I'm telling you, I need to play the lottery. Angela Walteraji, since you made your grand entrance and you're in red, feel free to introduce yourself. The red is for you. I knew you had something to say about it. <laughs> anyway, hello, everyone. My name is Angela Walteraji. I'm coming to you from the beautiful mid-Atlantic region. The trees are turning here in Maryland. And um, I'm glad to be here and join everybody tonight. All right, all right. Uh, let's see, we'll go with, of course, uh, let's see, oh, Shelly. Yes, ma'am. Family tree girl, <laughs> Shelly Murphy, located in Central Virginia. Welcome everybody. All right, Teresa. Hey, it's Teresa Vega, representing Uptown Manhattan, Radiant hey. Roots for RequaBranches.com. All right, and we have a new face here, beautiful Yay. new face. I'm going to read her bio so everybody knows who she is. If you are active on Twitter, Gen Chat, any of that stuff, you know who she is. But I, you know, I got to give her a nice drum roll. We got to give her, I don't have my tambourine. So I can we'll do to, one. We'll have to do a, a true <laughs> with fan for her. <laughs> Because True's always got the hot flash fan. Uh, so, <laughs> it's true. All right. So Melissa Parker is a certified archives manager currently working as the Houston County, Tennessee archivist. She is a professional genealogist and lectures, teaches, and writes about the genealogy research process, researching in archives, and records preservation. She conducts virtual webinar presentations all across the United States for genealogical and historical societies. She writes a popular blog called A Genealogist in the Archives. Archives. She is the reviews editor for the Federation of Genealogical Societies, which FGS, their magazine forum. She writes bi-weekly advice column entitled The Archive Lady that can be viewed at Abundant Genealogy. She writes the monthly column for the Archive Ladies Corner and the In-Depth Genealogist magazine. She writes bi-weekly columns for a local newspaper, the Stewart Houston Times, called From the Archive. She is a regular contributor as the Archive Lady on Lisa Louise Cook's Genealogy Gems podcast. She is married to her wonderful husband, Chris Barker, and has one grown daughter. Her professional genealogy ex expertise is in Tennessee records, and she takes research clients. She's been researching her own family history for the past 27 years. I introduce to you Melissa. I write everywhere, and she doesn't need another column for the next 10 years because she's got plenty. Yes. <laughs> Barker. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hello, hello. I'm so glad to be here. It's like, I feel like I know everybody intimately because I watch the show every time it's on. Thank you. Right. I'm glad, thank you. Now we know who like who one of our viewers is. You know, we don't ever know. Like we just know one. there are XYZ people here. Like we don't really know unless somebody's in the chat room. And we do see you in the chat room sometimes too. So yeah. yeah so I got to it. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. I got to give a shout out to the people in the chat room. Renata is there. She's not joining us. Lisa Gorell, my buddy from Oakland. Oakland <laughs> in the house, California Genealogical Society. She's actually watching on the Amtrak headed back home. Wow. That's pretty cool. All yeah. right. We've got Wanda Looney in the house, Karen Galloway. Karen Royal, my boo from New Orleans. That's I love her and Karen. <laughs> um, let's see. Francisco File. That's a very interesting name. Hmm. <laughs> Tammy Ozier, Clarice Mason, James Winder. We've got a lot of folks here. It's great. We've got to jump and jump and jump in chat room. So, all right, guys, topics for the night. We're talking about people of color research in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. And this, of course, encompasses the Northeast, right? You can't talk about these particular states in a vacuum. Like, they're just not like, oh, it's just New Hampshire. We all know that borders and county lines and all sorts of things, they, they vacillate depending on what's happening, right? We're, we, I think the process we see this more in now is gerrymandering and how quickly districts change. That's the way the boundaries change for states and counties and, and whatnot. And so um, when we're talking about the Northeast and particularly these locations, these states, what is the history of people of color in these areas? Because typically when we talk about people of color, we always really frame things from the deep South. We don't really ever venture far enough up north to really truly understand the context of, of what that means. So so panelists, what 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 would you consider maybe some un I don't want to say unshared or just just the history of people of color that that goes largely unknown in the Northeast? 
Well, I, let me answer here since I have colonial roots going back to probably the 16, late 1600s in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, we, were, we were here. We were here when the first white colonizers came. And some of us who also have Native American ancestry, we were always here. Um, so, so don't be misled. You know, there was an African presence going way back from the beginning. And um, whether it's from uh, uh, Connecticut up through Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, um, there has always been a presence of African, uh, people of African descent. And I know Shelley. I'll jump can, in. Um, I'll jump in. I lived in New England for about 14 years. And one of the things that I learned, I'm a Southerner, and living in New England was uh, a real big surprise to learn about the maritime history, to learn about the people who really uh, worked on the whaling ships, who worked um, uh, some, uh, of course, here in the Mid Atlantic, we have the oystermen, but we have a lot of people who worked uh, on the ships out of New Bedford. I'm sure Teresa certainly mm -hmm. can um, uh, agree with that in terms of the presence of people who worked on the on the boats and who worked on the Cape and worked on Cape Cod, mm -hmm. and then the presence of the people of color uh, on the two islands, both Nantucket and the Vineyard, Martha's mm -hmm. Vineyard. And um, so there's just a very rich maritime history that is there, not often spoken about either. And, um, and I was surprised even as a student in college, um, once upon a time in the last century, a very close friend of mine I met was native born Vermonter, a woman of color, and um, a, born and raised in the state of Vermont, and uh, a presence of people of color that goes back pretty far. Yeah. I think of it in terms of the three Ds, diaspora, dispersion, and displacement. And I think it goes for the entire Eastern seaboard, you know, yes. and, and a lot of these places, just like you're mentioning about the, um, the sea, the, the ports, there's such rich histories there. And like even New York tends to be isolated away from that, but all of these places are all connected by water. It sounds, it sounds so obvious, but you have to think about it with people, uh, the movement of people. Why do you think that, that folks tend to separate this region? Do you think, especially when it comes to people of color, do you think it has something to do with the fact that, that slavery didn't, ex you know, it didn't exist there as long as it did in the Deep South or? But it did exist there. It did yeah. exist. It did and, exist. And, and I think that's the myth is that, and I'm going to say uh, African-Americans do not know that there were people there because they tend to focus on the deep south and more towards the um, civil war time and not necessarily the colonial time because if most of your roots are deep south and connecting with slavery you're still not going to think there's anybody up through that east coast well you got to go look to find out because the states that we're talking about there was um, African Americans in the Revolutionary War from each of those states. I can't give exact numbers without looking it up, but there was a presence and whoever said, I think it was uh, Angela or whoever said, we were there. We definitely mm -hmm. were there. I'm setting up a table Friday, highlighting the, the opportunities for people to be able to see in Charlottesville uh, about the African American patriots and American Indians, just to mm -hmm. show we were there, mm -hmm. over six thousand of them, and mm -hmm. of course the majority of that is going to be up in those New England states. And I, and I would and, also add that two other things. One, uh, when you think of the North, it's more of a family-based slave system versus the large plantation Southern mm -hmm. system, and yeah. I think people equate slavery with plantation yeah. based slavery at the expense of not knowing about slaves in the north then you mm -hmm. have the issue of gradual emancipation taking place earlier in these states compared to other uh states in the south That's true so so there's there's this partial erasure of the black experience in new england because people oh, yeah. A, a equate New England would be in wider states and therefore there couldn't be people here. But as I said, we were here. 
Mm -hmm. the I would agree with that and, and supporting what Shelly just said in terms of patriots. I mean, we all, of course, we know who's the first person who died in the Battle of Lexington, Crispus Attucks. Was, he was native. You know, uh, he was first in line. That's, that's somehow that repeated all the way through Vietnam in the front line, I guess. But, um, you know, Salem Poor, he was from Andover, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And that's right. uh, Peter Salem, there were quite a few. We don't know their stories very well. Mm -hmm. We should know their stories. We should make a commitment to learning their stories. I'm trying. We really, really <laughs> should. And of course, there are the communities in the western part of Massachusetts, uh, Great Barrington. There are people of color there. One of the best photographers of the 20th century, James wow. Vandersee. He is That's from my, Massachusetts. That's in my family. My family. Uh, my there you family. go. A wonderful, wonderful history and a presence that goes back pretty far. We should make a commitment. And of course, don't let us not forget the universities, the, yes. the certainly the elite institutions with their legacy of slavery. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wanna I wanna jump in here since since Angela mentioned the Vanderseys. Um the Vanderseys were of course, uh, Dutch descent, but they intermarried with uh, African Americans. And I have direct cousins, fifth cousins, who are direct descendants of the Vanderseys who have Native American mtDNA. So when you're talking about the colonial African American presence in the Northeast, you, you have to understand those folks, your first slaves were Native Americans who intermarried with Africans. So like in my Greenwich, Connecticut, you know, our, our ancestors were native and they were African American. So we, we always have to look at that mixture of the two in the Northeast because it, it's real and it's present. I would say that the area that it probably mirrors most in the country would probably be New Orleans when you're talking about mm -hmm. uh, the prevalence of, you know, people of different races intermarrying. Um, and of course that being seen, you know what I'm saying? And then maybe you have stuff in coastal areas in terms of like actually having legal marriages or people going on a limb and trying to get married, that that whole sort of thing. Um, Karen Galloway asked about W.E.B. Du Bois, which is true, because wasn't his family from Massachusetts Boston. as well? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to comment back when Angela was talking about the history not being known. Even last night when we were chatting um, during Finding Your Roots, uh, you know, Jared mentioned about his ex, uh, what, third great grandfather, three brothers, African American, served in the uh, American Revolution. I know there's others that they had more, but this mm -hmm. is three from the mm -hmm. same family, notably served. And of course, I got to go look them up. You, you know, because it's interesting because I will put their names on that board. And again, an opportunity to share more. We know there will be 900 students that come through this exhibit area tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to learn something that there was African-Americans at the, you know, fighting in the American Revolution. It was an integrated uh, war. Mm -hmm. do you all, do you, it's an integrated war. Do you all think that the sort of erasure, it, it seems like this taking place with like <clears throat> the, just the history of people of color in the Northeast, do you think it largely has, has to do with like popular culture and the fact that the pieces that we've seen in terms of movies, television, things like that, like they revolve around the South and really sort of the first time we actually saw a free person of color or a black family like living and existing before slavery was abolished in a, in a uh, cinematic form was like 12 years a slave. Do you think it has something to do with that? I mean, because I know I can see the like Harper's Bazaar image of Crispus Attucks, or you know what I mean? Those those paintings, right? That that we that we see that recreate some of those things. But in terms of like current popular culture, that story is just not being told. And is it oh, because people? Well, I I think you need more glory sto stories. That's a fifth yes, or fourth element. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I, I I just think that not enough time has been invested. And telling the stories of these folks yes. in the north, 
because people again you know, you're, you're think, dealing with with slavery being seen as southern slavery versus slavery in the north and media in the united states is still very segregated mm -hmm. absolutely you know absolutely so, and, and don't forget yeah go ahead go ahead on just look at the difficulties with underground and that's a tremendous show <laughs> you know and they can't even get they can't even get a second season that's very interesting. Also, let's remember, as uh, Teresa was saying, we need more movies like Glory. Well, the fact is, okay, Glory was, I'm not sure, what, 20-something years ago, maybe, by now? Yeah. Um, before that, yeah. no one ever knew that there were almost 200,000 men of color in mm -hmm. the Union Army mm -hmm. and the Civil War. I never mm -hmm. heard it growing up. Mm -hmm. I have since about nine ancestors who were in the Civil War, freedom fighters, yet this has never been taught. And even so, to show you the power or the influence of media, whenever I mention something, U.S. color troops Civil War, oh, the soldiers, the guys who were in glory. No, I'm not talking about the soldiers from Massachusetts, but we don't even know that little tidbit that, yes, we were very, very active. It's un it's it speaks to the power of media, the power of film, but it also speaks to a very big weakness in society that an entire population gets its education from entertainers. Because well, that movie right, was right. And, 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 and what you're saying, That's Angela, right. one of the things that I need to do on my agenda this coming year is to go to the National Archives and hang out with Bernice. But in Greenwich, Connecticut, there were 18 black men who fought the, for the 29th Connecticut Infantry. And seven mm -hmm. are related to my wow. family. They are very. I bet deep. you have more from the fifty-fourth. Oh, I have. I. As well. I, I oh, and I'll actually, bet you a lunch. And I'll actually, bet you lunch. my listen, listen to this. Actually, my Howley Greenside from Peekskill, his daughter was married to George Butler, who was in the fifty-fourth Regiment, and his mother was black and native. Father was Haitian. Father fought in the Haitian. Well, you owe me lunch. Well, I, I think I think it brings up a very important point, though, and this is something that anybody that watches the show for an extended period of time knows. We're, we always advocate for people to tell these stories, whether yes. it's in blog form, whether yes. you podcast, mm -hmm. whatever you do, because mm -hmm. that's the thing. People learn differently, they process differently, and they pass the information on differently, and they engage people differently when they have a knowledge of their family history that challenges the narrative that people are spouting towards them. Right. When they'll, mm -hmm. they'll be able to identify quickly and early on will know actually that's not how it happened in my family and then you can actually refer back to and you can actually look at how it may have changed the trajectory of your family because you know this fact and then you can pass that on to to your younger people so let's talk about the nature of of slavery caste systems whatever they were in the northeast how did these things sort of differ um, you know, maybe in the states, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, from what we saw in, in the Deep South. And the other thing I think we also need to address um, that sort of wraps into that is the fact that you have to, when you're having discussions about the Northeast, you have to talk about how the slave system, despite the fact that people may not have owned slaves themselves, they profited from the enterprise living in the Northeast. The first set of folks that comes to mind are the DeWolfs mm -hmm. and how they owned ships that were used to transport, you know, sugar, whatever the, 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 the crop was from the Caribbean and bring it to the United States while these folks lived in the Northeast. There is a really, really good documentary. Um, I know it came on, I want to say it was Independent Lens, or it was on PBS at one point, that talked about how one of the descendants of these DeWolfs discovered that their family had this tie to slavery. She mm -hmm. always knew that their family, you know, were in the, they were, you know, in the merchant business, you know, in terms of, uh, of you know, participating, owning ships, things like that, but they didn't realize that it had a tie to slavery. And so we have to sort of, you know, include that sort of stuff in, in, in this discussion. So how did the caste system, how did slavery, how did the treatment of free people of color, like, or just people of color in general in the Northeast, was it the same as what was going on in the Deep South or was it different? Well, I think um, geography plays a lot of, uh, or plays a very large role in terms of many things, how people live, 
whatever, the, however they made their living. But we must not forget that there were many people who were indentured. You had many people who were disenfranchised, uh, regardless of color. You had people fleeing religious persecution in Europe who came across the pond. You had others um, who were indentured, who were paying off a debt, and they too um, were finding themselves in, in uh, situations of disadvantage. And of course, you had the enslaved. You had the enslaved who were working in case, what was the story? I can't remember the person who was on Bernice's show. Um, he uh, slaves at the Ivy League institutions. And at some point in time, you found that if the enrollment was down at a particular college, maybe Harvard or Yale or wherever, sometimes it was the people of color who outnumbered the students because they had to sustain the school. They're the ones who not only cleaned the residences, but they also carried the wood and the coal and kept things working on the grounds. They tended to the grounds. They tended to the buildings. And in some cases, um, and I name who wrote the book uh, on blacks and black history in the Ivy League institutions going to those days of slavery. Of course, those were servants per se, but not domestic servants as we think. All were not cooking um, or being, you know, a, a manservant. They were providing the labor. And uh, of course, where the cities were, then you could contrast life in the city to life in the country in any place. But one has to study rural New England um, to find out. And I've never really looked at rural New England to even see if there were um, many people enslaved. Um, the little I do know is that the people enslaved were in cities like Cambridge, cities like Boston, um, Springfield, Worcester. So I don't know um, about you know New Hampshire and uh, or other places, well, um, Connecticut. I, I, well, well, go Ellen, and I'll go after you. No, I was just going to add that you know I think that part of there's also that that feature of displacement where people with the most resources actually didn't have enslaved people in New England. They had them in Barbados, or they had them in the Caribbean, or they had their investments there, and in and then that money right, would go right. back to New England. Yeah. Right. So. And, 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 and I was going to add again, you, when you're talking about the Northeast, you, you have to consider gradual emancipation. Right. So in my family, uh, in, in Connecticut, it was seven, I believe Rhode Island as well. Gradual Emancipation Act came in in 1784. Mm -hmm. So my, my fourth great grandmother was freed 1800. Um, her husband, my fourth great grandfather, although he wasn't freed until 1816, they were living as free blacks when she was free. Um, so, so, Teresa, so, consider, so, we gotta, so, Teresa, so we have to remember, you got to remember, we know what this term means, but somebody who's watching may okay. not be familiar. Okay. They may be only familiar with what's going on in the Deep okay. South. We do, let me tell you. Below the okay, base I'll, of Dixon. I'll explain. I'll explain. Yeah. We don't okay. have so in, 17, in 1784, Gradual Emancipation Act, again, gradually emancipated. So if you were born um, before a certain date, I, I think it might have been July 4th, I, I forget the actual date, but if you were born before that date, you were a slave for life. Mm -hmm. If you were born one day after that date, if you were female, you had to serve 21 years a slave. If you were male, 25 years a slave. In Connecticut, that law was updated 1797, which meant that everybody had to serve 21, male or female, 21 years a slave. So I had, my fourth great grandmother had seven sons. I believe two or three of those sons had to serve the 25 years a slave and the rest 21 years. And then they were emancipated. So, so technically my, all of her children were emancipated about 18 by 1830. Her youngest kid around 1830, most of them before 1820. So when we talk about slavery in the North, we have to remember when we go back and look at the documents, there might not be documents because it was so early. You know, so so I know in my family, I'm in some of the wills I've been reading, I can go back to the mid 1700s and documents. I've been looking at the greater black community in Greenwich. So I can find in wills going back to the 1700s mention of, of people because there were um, mm -hmm. Again, African Americans who were freed. Even I have one family freed 1720. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, we, and Melissa, you know, as, so a, as an archivist, in terms of like these records that like Teresa is talking about, 
you know, how, because the word rare gets thrown a lot around a lot in genealogy TV. <laughs> like last night? <laughs> like last year. <laughs> That's how you know who watches the show. We'll, we'll be getting to that later on during current events because we know everybody wants to talk about rare. <laughs> but as an archivist, you know, we're talking about stuff that was created in the 18th century that, you know what I mean? Like how, you know, especially, I mean, cause you grew up in Massachusetts. So, you know, is it, the, I'll just say it like this. I'll never forget the first time I went to Massachusetts and I was driving down the highway and I saw a town founded in like 16 or 1700. And I was like, there's no way because yeah. I grew up in California. There's nothing that old out there. Oh yes, but, it's older. Yeah. It's but as European. A, <laughs> <laughs> but as an archivist, you know, we're talking about how you can get your hands on these records to actually research some of this stuff. Like, you know, is some of this stuff just, thank God it was microfilmed or, you know, how, I mean, how hard is it to keep this stuff together at this point? Um, well, it is deteriorating as we speak, but what I tell people is, and I'm so glad that Angela brought up the history and how, we're not taught the history. Um, what we're learning is from stereotyping, from television, from movies, you know. And so we've lost, we've actually lost the ability of how to learn our history in a lot of ways. And so that's why I'm such an advocate, even though I'm an archivist, but I'm an advocate for archives, um, any kind of archives, because it's not all online. And the archives are there, these records most of the time, I would say probably 90% of time, they're sitting on shelves in boxes waiting for genealogists or researchers to just request them. And some of these records aren't even microfilmed. And right. so you have to, when you're in that area of Massachusetts where Teresa is, you know, wherever you're at, you've got to seek out every single repository. I don't care if it's someone's house that has records in there because they're the county historian. You've got to find out where are the records and contact them, you know, and ask them, talk to them. What have you got? You know, what's not microfilmed? What's sitting on your shelves? You know, because you've got to seek it. These people that think, the genealogists that think it's all online or, you know, mm -hmm. I just need the birth, marriage and death date. That's all I need. No, there's so much more out there in these archives and repositories that can tell your ancestors' story, the people of color. In Tennessee, I do Tennessee research. We've, we've got it all here. I think, like you know, Nika, we've got uh, African American, we've got American Indian, we've got, you know, we've got it all here. And so I am a constant student of African American research because I have students in a genealogy class that I teach at my library. And when they started coming, I was kind of like, oh, okay. I need to teach myself more about this area of research so I can help them. Because just like Angela said, they don't know their family stories. They don't know mm -hmm. the African-American history. Like some of the whites don't know their own history. Right. Yep. And so it's just, it's important. I, I know I can, I know where I go to look because I do a lot of research in Connecticut. Are we get Nika, we're going to discuss places. To yeah, we're going to, we're going to, that's the last thing we're going to hit okay. before we yeah. wrap up the conversation. Okay. But, 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 um, but just to kind of circle back to sort of what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Cause I think, I think Angela and Melissa's points are like really, really important. And Critical. Shelly sort of talked, sort of touched on this in the chat mm -hmm. room is, you know, the fact that we've lost our ways to learn because they haven't, been digitized or preserved. So as that document deteriorates, there goes your opportunity to connect that person with their history and to change potentially the trajectory. I mean, you know, it, it it's sad, you know, you think about a fire, all sorts of things. I mean, like, have we ever really thought about how, take Wilkinson County, Mississippi, where my family's from, and the fact that the next, that that county, the courthouse burned. So, you know, you've got to go to different locations to try to find some of this stuff. I mean, you just don't know what kind of condition you find it in. But the, the fact of the matter is go find it. Don't expect for it to come to you while you're sitting at a desk with your house shoes on at one in the morning trying to find information. That's basically the point and, that, and, that we're making. And don't expect that every time there was a courthouse fire that all the records are destroyed. There is a county that is next door to my county that has records dating back to 1803. And they were in the Civil War. Fort Donaldson is only 20 minutes from me. It was fought in their county. And 
if you look anywhere online, it says their courthouse burned during the Civil War. Well, you know what? That's true. But what people don't know, this is the local story, and it's true. The Union, for some reason, the Union soldiers allowed the locals to come in and remove all of the records from the courthouse, and they stored them in a local cave. Wow. What so county that's is that? Stewart County, Tennessee. Okay, let me write that down. Yes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> that, that is amazing but but yep. melissa you're making a good point and and i advocate this when i'm teaching classes just because that county burned doesn't mean the records aren't there aren't some records there but the bigger thing is there's still people being born there's still marriages there's still people <clears throat> dying and taxes are still being paid and virginia for some reason i think I can't remember how many counties, but almost 75, 80% of the counties all had a, a burned courthouse or something in Virginia. Uh, and, and there's still records. I mean, yes. and we're still accessing the records. So I don't want listeners to, to keep that attitude. And I'm going to say it's an attitude that yeah. when they hear, oh, it's a burned county. I can't find this. I can't, can't find that. Well, number one, all records might not have stayed at one place. There might have been a record that came into the courthouse but had to go somewhere else, you know, and again, follow up on whatever else was happening during that time. Don't stop just because it says it's a burned county. You just got to take a little more twist and, and walk a little exactly. differently in your research. I agree. Exactly. I I think to circle back around to what we were talking about in terms of, cause this, this really is life. You know what I mean? Can you imagine yes. County courthouse burns down 1825, all of your records are in there that mention your gradual emancipation. Who's got the original? Well, you, have or, to you know what I'm there. saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I, mean, I, I just, always, they tried to also to duplicate these records at different sites. The Abolition Society had papers, but they also filed papers with the court. So there's also times where you'll have was set one place and not in the other. Well, you know? well, I, I want to jump in here because in, in the North, I don't know how many, you know, if, if burnings happen here, probably abolitionist papers, I believe. But literally, there's information out there that no one has accessed. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the local historical societies and said, look, do you have this information? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Let me look. And then it's there. You know, so, so a lot of these places in the Northeast, information is there, but no one has gone and sought it out. And I hate to say it. You know, we live in predominantly white states and, and the people, it is not us who are the archivists a lot of times. So certain people are not vested in looking out for our interests. Only we can go in and do that. And I have to say that because I don't want people to be misled and say there's no information we can't. No, information is there, but people haven't accessed it. They don't know how, they don't know where to go. And that's why we're here to tell them, right? Well, and, and that's what I was gonna say because and when we're talking about information, we have to remind everybody that we're not just talking about mm -hmm. a census. Because you have to remember, and some of the early times that, that we're talking about, I mean, we're talking 18th century, 19th century, you know, it's just the head of household on a census. It's not the entire household like we, you know, we've come to rely on in 1850, 1860. You've got to really, that's that to me, when you get into research before 1850, that really is a proving of your skills as a genealogist, because you can't rely on that one record that has that household all nicely put together. And, you know, you've got to really dig and get familiar with what's available in particular areas. And I think this is a great segue into talking about crucial record sex, how to access records. Like number one, in terms of these states, how are they organized? When we talk about going to do research in Tennessee, there are several clerks that you can go to to find information. Whereas in Louisiana, it's just one. 
Go to the county clerk. They've got the court records. They've got the marriage licenses. They've got, got the deeds. Everything. They got the mortgages, right? Tennessee, no. I was like, why are there 15 <laughs> clerks? I don't understand. Why is there so many? So when we're talking Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, how how are the states organized? And, and when you go to do on-site research, you know, you need to be prepared with that information. Well, for me, and, and, and I'll only introduce it this way when i'm doing massachusetts or connecticut new york anywhere up that line rhode island you know the first place i go is not the archives i go to the local historical society or i tap into the local libraries around in that county and just start asking questions then i'll go you know to the uh the archives and things like that but i gotta hit that local piece first because mm -hmm. I think there's, if, if it's not the actual records to have access to, they know where to direct me. And then I start building that list of what are the records and the resources and where they're at. The historical society, what I've found um, most important for me working on a DNA, DR, DAR application was the town minutes. Well, mm -hmm. in Virginia, I wasn't finding town minutes, but in Connecticut, I found town minutes. So I've got to prove somebody's residency during, or, you know, the time during the Revolutionary War, that colonial period, these town minutes are going to be the document that removes that roadblock, you know, on, on this person's residency. I wasn't finding that in other states. So again, I go local first and then creep off into the national. And uh, you typically are not going to get this stuff online. You're going to have to deal with them directly. Either go there or deal with them directly. Join the, you know, the historical society or a genealogy group there. And Facebook has been a safe haven also to be able to tap into resources in those local areas. And, 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 and I'm going to piggyback off what Shelly just said. Um, you have to go to the local level. I, I'm right now researching uh, and visiting uh, local uh, historical societies in Westchester, but I've been able to um, look at probate. A lot of information is in probate records. Um, land deeds are another one. Um, because uh, uh, free blacks were listed in the earliest census, as early as 1790, you can look at residents, um, newspaper articles going back that far. Um, if you go to the Historic Society, look in their vertical files for something. I have church records. I have cemetery records. All of this, it, you have to go to the local level and look. And then from there, in Connecticut, records, I know in my Greenwich research, if and, and um, because Greenwich was part of Stanford, records prior to like 1840 are in Stanford. They're not in Greenwich. So you have to know what years your folks were there and where to go. Um, and, and again, I've been able to trace back, you know, I have my fourth great grandfather's, um, you know, his, his, he was net worth of a hundred dollars when his, <laughs> and, and his slave owner's will, when he was emancipated three, I think three months after his slave owner died, you know, so you can find all this information, but again, you have to know where those local records are and where to look. And, um, and then from there, you go out to state archives. Uh, Connecticut, you have Yale University. You have different universities might have different connections. You have the Museum of Connecticut. I mean, there's different places you can branch out, but start at the local level. Okay. I agree and with Teresa. You know, okay, I, have been, I have been known, and I've done this once or twice, I have been known to call the local library the local chamber of commerce anyone that would know and ask who was the oldest person in the community and when mm -hmm. i can get a name and a contact and from especially if i'm having a hard time finding out where the records because the clerk said they were sent here the historical site said they're over here i call that person and i just pick their brain this is what i'm kind of looking for and you know sometimes the county historian whether they're actually named that or just known for knowing all the information you know they have it in their brains and so That's calling true. them and getting in contact with them and picking their brains, where are the records? Oh, yeah, well, those are stored down there at that old warehouse. You know, you don't know what you're going to get. But I've been known to do that, to get that yeah. 
that local. That's an excellent tip. That is very good. Yeah, I don't ever go to a county uh, and not call beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. And the other thing I don't is, either. yeah, the other thing is too, you might get somebody who hasn't been there that long on the phone. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. usually when I get there, I'm like, so yeah. I kind of feel around like, okay, who's the lady who's had her desk here for like, 25 years like yes. i just i'm i'm horrible like i'm just like okay who's lady who has not moved her fi pictures off or who's got grandkids that are on the desk and i'm like okay miss mary that's who i need to talk to because she knows where everything is in here and yeah. sometimes you have to push a little bit because the folks are like look i'm not going down to the basement i saw some something down there that and i don't like the last time and it moved <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, sometimes folks just do not want to be bothered with that. So you have to push a little bit. But I've had some amazing finds that, that yeah. took place as a result of that. So I think, you know, do your due diligence. I always tell people, don't just jump into doing a research trip and doing on-site research and you haven't done your research on your research trip. Does that make sense? Like, yes. well, that makes perfect like, sense. Yes, like, yes. You've got you gotta to do your research for your research trip. What are um, the hours of operation? I have yes. a friend that yes. has gone to the National Archives three times. <laughs> the first two, it was closed. Closed. <laughs> and she didn't realize because she didn't do her research for her research trip. Yep. So right. find out the hours. Find out what you have access to. Ask the question about what's kept on site and what's kept in storage. Because sometimes when you have these older towns, counties, yeah. mm -hmm. they remove some of those very old records and they put them off somewhere and you might not have access to it or you have to put in a request for them to bring those yes. books to later. Right. So, you know, I'm, this is this is coming from Nika. I've done a lot of research trips. <laughs> I have been in those funky basements. I have been with the rat poo-poos and the, yeah. and the, and the, and the roaches and the, yes. <laughs> And let yeah. me tell you something from an archivist. If you call ahead and you can give me a little bit of information before you come, guess what? I'm going to start looking before you right. get there. And so yes. that will help you if you're on a time crunch. I can already start looking and pulling before you even get there. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. Um, I went to Medina County, Ohio, and, you know, we're heading to Michigan and we stopped there. But what I did was, I made contact first with the historical society, said, this is who I'm looking for. This is a time frame. My goal was to find the land where my ancestors were at in 1859. And so let me tell you what, guys, when I walked into the library, that's where they met me at. That's where they held their meetings. They mm -hmm. had everything laid out for me and the mm -hmm. map and basically said, here, go go to your land, your, your people's place. Mm -hmm. You know, buying this land in Ohio, free colors, buying 25 acres in 1859. And they gave us the map, they gave the books, they showed and had places marked, you know, it was fabulous. Same thing when I go up to Loudoun County in Virginia. I, I First I contact the clerk of the court these are the deeds I'm coming that I want to see and pull, make copies of. So they pull all the originals. The stack is there when I walk in. Well, I've been coming up there enough. So like Nika said, plan the trip. Put down what you're focusing on because you're always going to find something else. But I stay with my script first, my bullet list first, Me what too. I'm specifically looking for. And I try to make notes or take quick copies of whatever else it is. But I got to stay focused on my list, my to-do list. But again, then I go to the library up there. Same thing. It's, it's ready for you. It helps them because I asked them, how do you, what's best? Should I request it this way or do I need to come here? This, that, and other. She said, give me the list. They had it all pulled. All these freedom, a uh, certificate of freedom for my family that was up there in Virginia. And it was amazing. And I tell you, plan, plan, plan. Well, you, the other thing is you have a clear head when you're not there. Yes. Like, like let me, <laughs> and let me like, just say that. Because the minute, the minute that yeah. book comes out, <laughs> yeah. the first one, and here and you, they put they take and, and so what I love is when they're just so sweet. I love when the artist says, Oh, okay, okay. So here's we went to the index. Let's yeah. pull the book out. So they bring the book out, and you're like, 
I'm really here. I'm really going <laughs> to see it. And then you go through the record and you're like, these are my people. And yeah. then you start seeing names. You don't know who the people are. And you're like, but wait a minute, what happened? And then you end up going through a rabbit hole, completely forgetting <laughs> about the whole reason why you came yes. to that question. Am I preaching? Because let me tell yes. you, yes. I am maniacal yes. in the courthouse. Like, yes. seriously, I tell people, you might not be able to handle me because yes. I'm going to keep bringing you back to this paper. Yes. What we said we were going to do. Okay. No, you said you want to confirm a slaveholder. Why are we looking at taxes for 1925? <laughs> That's another trip. But That's another trip. We yeah. came here for a slaveholder. So let me bring you on back. You get and, greedy, and though. You, you get greedy. You do. It's, it's really getting greedy. It's greedy. Mm -hmm. it, it is. It's getting greedy. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. So in terms of online records, since we kind of shaded the online records, I'm, people are going, people are so funny. I'm telling you guys, we actually actually did a hangout on on uh, offline research. If you haven't, it's like one of the first episodes of Black yeah. Virgin Live. You need to go back and look at it because I'm telling you, I'm notorious, but baby, I produce and I get exactly what I'm looking yeah. for. Because bright, shiny objects will derail you every <laughs> single time. That's why people, that's why everybody's laughing. Bright, shiny <laughs> objects will derail you. And I already know Teresa is about that business like me because you see her, she's in full court reporter mode right now. Yeah. Because <laughs> <she knows. laughs> <Damn. laughs> But it's true. Bright, shiny objects will derail you every single time when you go and do on site research. They will. And you have, I mean, literally, I make a table. That has for. check marks. Yes. I write the date That's I look what for I the do. information. Yeah, I did where I search. D yeah. Did this come through? Did this not come through? Because I mean, you got to yeah. think about it. If you're working still, this is time you're taking off of your job. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, you may only get two weeks a, a year. And I used to hog all my two weeks for a research trip and take them. So, yeah. you know, the, the, this is still, this goes without saying, we, we're going to have a research trip um, show next year, I'm sure, where <laughs> we can really, like, give you all of our feedback. But but it's true. So in terms of online records with regard to um, Connecticut, Massachusetts, yeah. and New Hampshire, you know, what are we looking at? Are, what are, are, the, are there some good, is there a good death index, marriage records? you know, birth records, what do we have available oh. on the, on the, you know, the majority of stuff. And Shelly brings up uh, New England Genealogical Society. Of course, that is something that, that has to be brought up. Um, if, if you have ancestry in the, in this area, you definitely should consider joining in um, any, any HGS um, for. Which is interesting because I bet there ain't 10 black people that belong to that society. And you know, we got black people in those states and See the now? records are there. It's there. there. And I got, I got, there. I got five places that, that I refer to. Um, there's ctgenweb.org yeah. that will look at, give you all the uh, records by county. Okay, so you just go to which county in Connecticut. There's also the Museum of Connecticut History. That's museum of cthistory.org. Uh, you can find out information there. Uh, you have the... Um, ConnecticutFreedomTrail.org, CTFreedomTrail.org, shameless plug. Two of my family's locations are listed, Thomas Lyon House, as well as the AME Church, Lake Avenue uh, in Greenwich. You also ha it should check out the university. So Yale University has the Gilda Lerman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition. So there's a ton of stuff there. Uh, of course, um, Connecticut State Archives. Um, and again, each town will have a local historical society for the most part. Go to the county, look up that town's uh, uh, historical society and, and start there first. Okay, anything with regard to Massachusetts, New Hampshire that we can think of offhand in terms of just what's available online? I um, would just make a mention for early 20th century research in uh, New England, particularly in Massachusetts, you do find in Barnstable County, um, particularly as well as on Martha's Vineyard, you will find uh, African and Native American blended families in the 1900 and 1910 Special Indian 
census, wow. the same census that we talk about when we talk about Oklahoma or parts mm -hmm. of the West, uh, far West and Southwest. Uh, the Indian communities were captured there, uh, as well as in um, Connecticut, uh, the Pequot community, and um, also, of course, well, New York, Long Island, which actually sort of touches New England, even though it's, it's not New England per se. But the 1919 Special Indian Census, you do find uh, blended families there. Yeah, and I would also say at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, I believe they have an, uh, an African-American uh, genealogy um, uh, resource there. I know that um, a couple of years ago, I was contacted by a professor who was gathering uh, information about um, African-Americans in Massachusetts and had con actually contacted me, uh, Shelley, about the Goins link to my family. Um, so there, there again, Harvard University, check out your un universities and, and all the uh, New England states as well. Um, it, uh, I, I was I just, have, go ahead. I was going to say I have resources for Rhode Island too, but finish what you were going to say. Okay, and that, that's what I was going to say. Rhode Island also ties into this as well. Can you just talk about that very, very briefly? I'm going to give you some of the sources from my good friend Keith Stokes, who is African American with roots going back to revolutionary. So um, there's the Newport Historical Society. There's the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society. Um, there's the Rhode Island Historical Society, and of course the uh, Rhode Island State Archives and and you know, you can contact all those places about their African-American um, uh, co collections. And of course, Providence used to be a major slave port. So there is a ton of information out there. I would be contacted Brown University um, uh, to see what they have in their collection as well. Okay, and uh, with regard to just online records, this is just taking a cursory just search for these locations. You've got state censuses in Massachusetts, with, and you've got a ton of vital records available on both Family Search and um, on Ancestry.com. You've got to make sure that you hit up, um, and you know, and you may you may see records, and you might have an index for a vital record: birth, marriage, or death be sure to hit the local level or get the microfilm copy or the original copy of those records that have been indexed because there likely is information on those records that will take you back further. But if you just rely on an index that is generated for a website, you may miss that opportunity. So we just have to, just have to kind of remind people because some folks get excited when they get the index and they forget that there's actually a document that created the index. Right. <laughs> So um, I want to give a, a shout out to the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, the library in D.C. as a place for research, um, not just American Revolution research. They have records and collections and holdings to do, I'm going to say, regular genealogical research. So that's another place to tap into. And I actually did a short blog on uh, because Angela uh, over a year ago had made a mention about she was not going to the DAR library based on you know her family research for Deep South and and not going there and not knowing if they had anything that would aid to her research. So I actually took the train up to DC, got a hotel room, and took took myself into the DAR library and start looking at what was there and had chatted a little bit with Bernice Bennett. Lots of research can be done at that library. The holdings are deep, they are vast, and there are African-American resources and records there. So I think it's another place not to, you know, don't just think of the archives because you got the Library of Congress, you got the archives, you got the DAR library, and there's other places, you know, that will hold records that can help us for New England research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any final words before we move into Ask Mariah when it comes to researching in the Northeast? I know some questions. <laughs> um, I actually want to share some viewer feedback that we got. Um, one of my buddy, Lisa Gorell made a very, very important point. I think it's true. She said our history when we were in school was written from the U European 
point of view. So many people's history who co-lived with whites are lost and were or were ignored. Right. Even non-English white groups were ignored. And I think that's that's an important point to make and to make sure that we hit on. Uh, there are there are folks who have uh, deep south genealogy and they are wondering, is there any have we ever heard of anybody who's been able to connect their deep south roots to the northeast or to some of the colonies? Have you all ever encountered anybody who's been able to do that? Or is it fairly isolated to folks who were in the northeast stayed in the northeast and then people who were the deep south stayed, you know, the deep south? No. no. You, they're connecting. I, they, they're connecting. For example, I have a, a, a young cousin on my Greenwich line and his ancestors actually came up right before the civil war around the civil war from uh, uh virginia and and you know you see that um uh connection there so it, it goes back and forth it just depends on the year mm -hmm. and 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 is that a documented connection meaning that yes you know you share dna but oh, yeah, yeah. have you discovered how like where the tie is oh yeah oh, oh yeah it's quite clear and, and especially in greenwich they brought up these rich folks brought up a lot of domestic servants um, um, around the time of the Civil War directly after, and you can, you make that connection. Absolutely. And, but yeah. I think the question was a little different, wasn't it? Meaning someone who had New England roots during exactly. the colonial era, and well, we're talking about a person who was rooted in the South, but found that, you know, a fourth or fifth grade grandparent. I, 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 have a, I have a third great grandmother who was born, who arrived in from born in Virginia, arrived in 1828. We yeah, can't locate her because. How about deep set? That, that's what I was going to say. That, that's that's, that's, that's yeah. the difference. Yeah. Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana. Yeah. I think Landlocked. Usually, we have no ocean, no port. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I'm hard. Sorry. Yeah, well, and I can't say it's, I don't want to say it's impossible though. I, yeah. I think typically the connection that's made between the deep South and the, and, and the Northeast is usually through a European ancestor. Mm -hmm. That, that's been yeah. my experience. Oh, yeah. It's oh, been yeah. largely, yeah. and a lot of that is, is because oral history drove the story or, or helped guide mm -hmm. the research. Also, mm -hmm. it comes up in DNA. And you keep seeing repetition of this particular surname, location, county, pedigrees. That's usually the way that a lot of folks have been able to tie the the deep south from, um, you know, to the the northeast in in genealogy research. Um, but I, you know, but but that's the thing that that's something that takes a lot of work. Um, it's not something where you can just, you know start looking at somebody in Nutbush, Tennessee and try <laughs> and try oh, to connect. Tina Turner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Nutbush is not that far away. But you can't just, you know, really start looking at Nutbush, Tennessee and expect to get back to the colonies. You know, you you've got to really do the groundwork and the footwork um in order to get that together. Um and so uh the other thing I would say is don't rule it out also, you know, there were there were late migrants to the deep south that were from the northeast. Mm -hmm. that didn't come down until mm -hmm. right before the Civil War or right after. Remember all the carpetbaggers who moved into the Deep South on a lot of that vacant and abandoned land after the war took place, took that over. And so, I mean, I know, for instance, in my family, I have a slaveholder who was born in Ohio that was in Louisiana. I was like, what are you doing here? You know, I recently was involved with a case where the person came from Indiana and was living in Louisiana. Why? You know, I'm like, why did you leave? But land, follow the land, follow the money, right? We talked about that earlier. So I want to give uh, one more. Um, there's also another comment that was made I thought was interesting. Shahida Ahmad said, because a lot of the northern states contain so many of the southern migration migrants, we are looking at cluster populations. And so counties are very important as well as the city directories become. Because there is a sort of, usually in our instance, and she's right, we're looking at people who move to these locations as a result of the great migration. So their existence in these locations is really from the vantage point of the 20th century potentially maybe the 19th century, and that their roots are also traced back down to down south, which is absolutely 110% correct. So, all right. Well, thank you guys so much. We know it was a meaty conversation. There's no way we can cover the entire Northeast. I don't think we did Rhode Island enough justice, but, you know, 
there's always another show, right? Um, Alyssa, feel free to stay on with us for Ask Mariah, but don't feel like you have to because you might have to go home, do something, whatever. Um, <laughs> or if you might be at home, I didn't think about that. I am at home. <laughs> Hey, sometimes, look, Colleen was, was at work still because she was in California. So I just have to, yeah. I was like, let me tell people ahead of time that they can leave if they want to. Um, but we're going to go oh, ahead. I would not miss asking Mariah. Are you kidding me? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some folks are like, you know, I got to go. I got something to eat, blah, blah, blah. Oh, oh no, I'm, I'm hanging right out for the long haul. You just go on. Okay, okay. All right, everybody. It is time for your favorite part of the show, which is Ask Mariah. Of course, yeah. we've got we've got Mama up there with with Baby Teresa. That's, <laughs> my, that's my name, Fisher. <laughs> that's like um, the only baby picture I have. Oh, and so she, Teresa looks like Teresa. If you, thought, if you didn't think she liked her, she looks like Teresa. Anywho, if you've never heard of Ask Mariah, this is the portion of our show where we allow you, the viewer, to submit your questions to the panel, and we actually help you do your research live. I always have to remind people that I never let the panelists see the question or the query beforehand because they will try to research it until the cows come home. So just so you know, they are just seeing this information for the first time when you all see it as the audience. And as I mentioned earlier, don't forget that you can be at, you could be you know submitted into winning a free four day pass to Roots Tech just by submitting your case to Ask Mariah during the month of November 2017. And we have got a doozy of an Ask Mariah tonight. It's a lot of slides. Y'all be careful. I see Angela's got a pen. I'm gonna need her to take some notes. <laughs> <I'm ready. laughs> because this is a doozy for tonight. All right. Oh. I went backwards. All right, here we go. All right, so Ask Mariah's question tonight is from Jennifer Maricelli. She says, I am stuck on my paternal side. I am biracial and I'm hitting walls on my black branch. I have a question on how our name changed from Moncrief to Ooh. Mitchell. Wow. So she wants to know how her family name changed from Moncrief to Mitchell. She says, I want to know if I'm even a Mitchell or a Moncrief. My father was killed when I was 18. And I want to know how the name changed. And if the legend is true that, quote, Lady Mitchell, you have to say her name like that because you can't just say Lady Mitchell. You say Lady Mitchell gave us uh, her uh, gave us gave her uh, our last name. Who is Lady Mitchell? For some reason, I'm feeling like Harlem Knights and Della Reese. Like she looks like Lady Mitchell. <laughs> I don't know if the one like... who lost her pinky toe. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, that is so funny because usually when I give pop culture references, Angela is the only one that never gets it, and she got it tonight. Lord I'm not her. the only one. We talk afterwards. <laughs> Who was she talking about? I have no idea. <laughs> Come on, Shelly, you know, and Bernice is out there. We, we have these discussions. I have no idea. Only she and James were laughing. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Age, so finish, age finish. and location. Yes, exactly. <laughs> age and location. Here you go. Here you go. Ellen's like, let's move it along. Okay, so she says, uh, listen, she's like, I've traced to my sixth great grandfather. Um, in Jamaica. So we are dealing with Jamaica, Jamaica. here, okay? Not She's Jamaica a trace to my sixth great grandfather oh, in Jamaica. Honest, and their story is fascinating. My great grandfather was born Arthur Daniel Mitchell in um, 1879. He you know, lived between 1879 and 1924. And he was born in St. Anne, Jamaica. He came to the U.S. for medical school and moved to Pocahontas, Virginia, and was a doctor there as it was a mining town. That's interesting. So that means he was treating black lungs quite a bit. All right. So in the U.S., he went by Arthur Moncrief Mitchell. He met and married my great grandmother, Aline Matney, and they had and had my grandfather, James Edward Mitchell. Jamaica's in there, but it's not the main question. He was just born in Jamaica. So she don't care about Jamaica. That was just for fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, still got a couple more slides. Arthur's father was Augustus A. Moncrief Mitchell, born June 16th, 1850 in Kingston, Jamaica, died May 13th, 1910. Our research finds that Peter Moncrief, born between 1813, or actually born 1813, died 1876 as the father of Augustus. So somewhere the Mitchell name is started and we can't locate any information on it. Peter's father is Benjamin Moncrief. So we're dealing with 
this is be a third or fourth great grandfather for her. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's a fascinating character, a prominent attorney that was born a slave. And John Moncrief, his father, who was a quadroon that sued for his freedom and won. Many lawsuits filed that he sued for freedom of many other women and children, slaves, but kept them himself. <laughs> This kept is getting slaves. really interesting. Yeah, yeah he kept the slaves even though he sued for their freedom. Lord, oh boy. Mm. All right, That's last slide. She has tested with Ancestry DNA. Um, she's not finding many Jamaicans, but of course they don't show up as Jamaican. Of course they don't. She says, she's. <laughs> I have Scottish and, and lots of different African yeah. heritage. I haven't found other Mitchells except my immediate family that I know. The problem is their father, my grandfather's brother, is not the biological child of Arthur Daniel. DNA came back Jewish. I have no other male descendants from that mother. And she says, so uh, she's got various family history docs uh, and, and book excerpts. So we've got a meaty ass Mariah. We're trying to pin down daddy's people. And we want to know if Mitchell, why was the name Mitchell taken and, and, and as a verse to Moncrief? My initial thoughts on this in terms of DNA is don't assume that there are no other male children. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ever assume with DNA. Ever. My, I when, when you think you know, you don't really know. Yeah, and it's sort of fascinating that I, I have Mitchells from that area of Virginia, and I do know. It was when I think of slave trade, I think of Virginia to Barbados or to Jamaica and these other places. So that that's an interesting mm -hmm. link there. Mm -hmm. um, and the Mitchells, there were some Mitchells in Greater Richmond who were active uh, uh, trade um, slave traders. Slave so, traders. Yeah, big time. And uh, I'm thinking our Mitchells come off of one of their lines because that's a, a, a European uh, wide DNA that we have. Interesting. Um, I, I've got a quick question. Yes, now, now, Virginia, and there's a, she said the Pocahontas, Virginia. Yes, it's now, a black community. There, Pocahontas, Virginia, there's a town, Pocahontas, Virginia, mm -hmm. but Pocahontas, Virginia, the town is in Tazewell County. Yeah, Tazewell County. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. I, I would ask that she look deeper into those mm -hmm. roots as far as who who was there earlier than when her people came and um you know kind of questioning why did they come there versus maybe somewhere else or is there some occupation or religion or some reason that they hit that area and her family history that's a coal mining area so that's a whole nother set. There's some historical stuff in that in that county. But again, it's a historical coal mining town. But her interest. Go ahead. I was going to say, I'm wondering, though, because her interest primarily is, were they really Mitchells or were they Moncrief? And right. part mm -hmm. of me and Karen actually hit on this, because th when I first saw that name, I was thinking South Louisiana all day. Um, because people, there's Moncrief, Moncrief right. is a derivative of that. Um, I, part of me wonders since that is, I mean, you know, my, my language isn't that good, but Kinda that sounds French. French. Moncrief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds Frenchy to me. Um, the, the question I would have before, you know, Angela chime in after me is, does she have the immigration paperwork for her grandfather? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'm trying to get on find my pass right now to see if I can see a rival record just to see what other kinds of data is included there. Yeah, um, I'm looking at the um, what is this website? Slave ownership database. Um, yeah, I think or, that's uh, what uh, University of College uh, London. Yeah, mm -hmm. Ellen just posted yeah. that. Yeah. It's a, it's a George Moncrief was the original owner of Back Blackburn House in West Lothian. He made his fortune by producing sugar in Antigua and exporting it to Britain. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a family connection and then you mm -hmm. drop the name because it becomes inconvenient. And Mitchell sounds a heck of a lot. It you sounds know, more you English. You can fly with that in it Virginia. It sounds more yeah. English, in fact. Yeah. Moncrief is Scottish. 
It is, but it's like a middle, it, but it's still, it's, it's yeah. not going to, it's not going to sound, everybody's going to be asking where you're from, which probably they don't want that name. Maybe the person even got involved in abolition later and decided that they wanted to break off from their family, the same way Teresa found with some, some of the research that she did, where people drop the name and they go back to a middle name. So mm -hmm. you got two men who were like, what, Augustus A. Mm -hmm. Moncrief Mitchell. So is that the mother or the father? Is that, is he recognized by somebody? And is there an issue of that, a legitimacy, you know, or illegitimacy? And then when it happens with people with resources, do they take the kid in or not? Do they take the name or not? I mean, there's a lot of questions there and I wouldn't be surprised if any of these things are part of that story, you know? In the, in the origins, and I'm gonna throw this question to Angela, in the origins of a language in a, of the Moncrief to Mitchell, could they not just be the same? Mm. You, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, coming over time yeah. to the different locations and different soundings and things a, like um, that because if we're feeling it's French, it's Scottish, and there's even more that I'm seeing right quick just looking online. And and again, M O N. I, I mean, you're starting off the, uh, you know, Moncrief Mitchell. And depending on where it's at and how it's pronounced, could we not also not ignore the fact that it could just be a change of spelling? I, I think. Well, that's I would just say that one's a derivative, but yeah, um, yeah, that's it's it's so so distant. It's like saying, uh, is is Jones a derivative of Johnson? Yeah. Well, well, the, the question <laughs> yeah. the question I have is how much research has she done in Jamaica about the Mitchells mm -hmm. in Jamaica? That's that was going to be my me, next well, question. She, yeah, she, she mentioned in Jamaica. She needs to go in Jamaica, and we know that there's a historic tide between Virginia and the English speaking Caribbean, whether it's yeah. Barbados, yes. uh, 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 Jamaica. It could be anything. It, there, there's. I think she needs to go back to Jamaica and find out where the Mitchells. It's hard to situate the surname Mitchell in a place where you have historic Mitchells going back to colonial, you know, 1600s. That that's a that's a jump. It seems like she needs to do a little bit more research in Jamaica. <laughs> There's a Moncrief patio shop in Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the Moncrief, I mean, to to your point don't ignore it just because you know what she said you know i heard nika say something that she said it wasn't about jamaica no i think you need yeah. to go back yeah. i think she i right. agree i think she needs to search because apparently that's not an uncommon name there and i'm looking mm -hmm. there's even a facebook page on moncrief's patio shop it, you know, and well, stuff. There's something that I, uh, Melissa, you were you were going to ask something. I'll um I'll chime in after you. Oh, just what Shelly said. Um, you know, the the person who's doing this research, she says, you know, don't worry about Jamaica. I'm not worried about Jamaica. No, she needs to go back, like Teresa and Shelly said, mm -hmm. go back to Jamaica. And if she's worried about the fact that she can't travel there, and so she's not focusing there, you know what? They have email and telephones just like we do. Yeah, I love her because that's the real, that's real talk. They got the internet in Jamaica. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> God, they Mr. Do. Moncrief that owned the patio shop was murdered. Oh my gosh, Shelly is. It, she, I need to get her out of the patio shop. She needs to leave the patio shop. <laughs> yeah, but it's not. Y'all need to go to the Mobile. Family name. <laughs> That's the family name. That's why it I'm calling is. that out in, in Kingston, right in Jamaica. It is, and something that I will I will add, and this is this to me looks like this may potentially be a website we all need to hang on to, in particular, folks. And I'll I'll bring it up so you guys can see it, but particularly folks who have a genealogy that they're doing in um in the go on the Gulf Coast, where you know, slaves may have been taken or, you know, due to various revolutions, whatever it is, um, they may have repatriated to, you know, or been repatriated to, to the Southern states mm -hmm. or, you know, the deep South. I didn't even know this existed, but thank you, uh, Jennifer, because girl, look at this. This is the University College of London. They've got a database mm -hmm. called the Legacies of British Slave Ownership. 
And it's at the Center for the Study of Legacies of British Slave Ownership. And it's been established at the school with the generous support of the Hutchins Center at Harvard. The center will build on two earlier projects based at UCL, tracing the impact of slave ownership on the formation of modern Britain. And I bring this up because I found a document on this site with the Moncriefs. Mm -hmm. And it talks about them being in St. Anne, which is an area that she mentioned that her grandfather was from in Jamaica. And it's got associated people, it's got a timeline, it's got all kinds of nice little stuff. Look at this, you guys. That's great. Now, maybe this is what Look she at... found. This might be what I'll she found. Oh, you've gone past it. It's okay. Because uh, it says specifically Jamaica, Barbados, and Grenada. So definitely this is a site that's going to be very useful. Yeah, yeah. I think so. She, I'm... She... Nika, can you, type in, can you type in Mitchell? I'd be interested to see what pops up for Mitchell. Um, and while she's looking at that, there's a message board on ancestry for Moncriefs. I would definitely scan through there and look for any uh, Jamaican, look at this. Look Virginia at this. connections. Let's see. Um, I was going to see if I could put in more than one name. So if I could see if there's a Mitchell and a Moncrief mentioned together. But and I would check Mitchell. newspapers too. And, and for those connections, you know, like research in Fulton history, newspaper.com and things like that. And, and keep that correlation of, of Mitchell and Moncrief. And be careful yeah. not to take Mitchell, when you put those two together, that Mitchell becomes that first name. And, and it, Moncrief is the last. Is the last, yeah. yeah. So there, there are records. Um, it's saying to go to the next fifty. It's it's seventy two individuals, one hundred and thirty eight records on this particular site. The wow. thing I want to caution though with this, you all, is um, here's the thing. You've got this page. It talks about Moncrief's. It's in the same area that you know your grandfather was born in. It references estate records mm -hmm. and associated claims. You've got a timeline here. Mm -hmm. This does not absolve you from going to find the actual no. record. No. no. Because how do you know whoever indexed this did not, how do you know they didn't include a Mitchell? The only way you would know is if you actually went to go and find these things in Jamaica. And and my my thought process is that I honestly think that there was a one a, a woman Mitchell who intermarried with a Moncrief or that there was some relationship with a Moncrief whether somebody in their family worked for a Moncrief and took that they took that name as a, you know, maybe there was another Arthur Moncrief or an Augustus Moncrief, and they named the children after that particular person. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, um, and, and any other mention of a Lady Mitchell, that to me usually indicates that there's an older woman. Maybe Lady Mitchell was a grandmother of a Moncrief or, or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and your family actually were owned by her, but mm -hmm. then you were passed to one of her descendants who became a Moncrief. Yeah. Um, Lady Mitchell seems like a slave owner, female slave owner to me. Yeah. Maybe. I would also do a Google book search because I'm mm -hmm. seeing Mitchell, Moncrief. Um, to, you know, I, I'm Googling Mitchell family and the Moncrief families of Jamaica. And so she can mm -hmm. get some hits on there. There's Jamaica message boards also on the rootsweb.com mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's a Peter Moncrief and Jamaica's history and it's about the death about him and he died in St. Anne's and let me see if I can get that date so I think she's just gonna have to go back um, he died in 1876 Peter Moncrief died at Friendship in St. Anne's on the 6th of February, and again, this is back in 1876. They've got his obit. He was actually born in 1829 of West Indies, and he goes now, into now, now, St. Another, 
Now, another question I have, she didn't mention if her ancestor and Pocahontas had any siblings because it, I would go lateral. She did? She did. She okay. did. She said she said that she said that he had a brother, but they found out that he wasn't a biological brother. Oh, okay. DNA. No one else. All right. Yeah. And she claims there's no other male descendants. But to me, we're talking about Look potential intermingling. You know, my whole thing is like when you start intermingling races with folks, you can't just absolutely say, oh, there's no more kids. Because usually in those situations, <laughs> that man yeah. wouldn't just tipping out to her house. Mm -hmm. He might have been tipping out elsewhere. Yeah or his siblings were, or his cousins were. So, um, yeah, I don't think we're gonna get, there's no sense of finality to this. I think I think definitely um, going forward, I think her, her point is, or what she needs to hit is she needs to get on the ground in Jamaica. Um, and she needs to look at these records directly. She needs to look at all of her vital records for her family. Don't just think you know something. Look up the birth, actual birth record because she mentions birth indexes and stuff. We talked about that earlier. Don't just use the index. What is also on mm -hmm. that index in terms of the names of the parents, the witnesses for marriages, things like that. That's crucial information. And sometimes you cannot get that until you get on the ground. You may want to look to see if any of that stuff has already been digitized by family search so that you don't have to go, but then you also can't assume that everything has been uh, uh, microfilmed or digitized. Records may have been left behind or not included. Um, but I definitely think she's going to get more answers there. In terms of your DNA, I would suggest that you look at patterns. That's the only mm -hmm. way you can identify things. You're looking at patterns for surnames, locations, and pedigrees. Anything you see with at least two or three people with repetition and the research is sound. That's the other piece that I have to always remind folks for. You know, this week somebody tried to tell me through a family tree that a man living in Mississippi <laughs> married a black woman in Middle Tennessee during Reconstruction. A white man or? A white man married a black woman in Middle Tennessee during Reconstruction, meaning the Deep South, <laughs> meaning not New Orleans, <laughs> not the coast. <laughs> okay, and I was like, he could be the he could be the father. By my exactly, Melissa. I was like, he could be the dad, but not in Bedford County, Tennessee. No, no. ma'am. Not yeah. in Giles County. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> no, not in Hardeman County. It's <laughs> most counties. That's not happening. But I bring that I, up to say, go back and do the research yourself. What were you going to say, Angela, before we get into current events? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a reference to the um, site that you just mentioned, Legacies of British Slave Ownership. There is a very good page coming out of Jamaica, St. Anne in particular, people who were associated with various estates who were enslaved. And these years go from 1792 up to 18, oh my goodness, this goes on and on and on, 1832, that, that time period. But it talks about how many people were enslaved on which estate including um, in 1832 in the possession of Hamilton Brown as attorneys of Mr. Mitchell and company for an undivided uh, uh, amount. And it talks about 27 enslaved people attached to that estate. Wow. And um, there are other references to Mitchell's and other families. Um, uh, 205 in Boroughbridge who were registered to William R.S. Mitchell and Company. And this information is also transcribed at JamaicanFamilySearch.com. JamaicanFamilySearch.com. So there's some good references off mm -hmm. of that British um, site that you get, Le Legacies of British Slave Ownership. I posted, and, and uh, Ellen also posted a site where I posted okay. 1794, Mr. John Moncrief of St. Mary's. Uh, a free quadroon man planner and his wife was a free mulatto woman and she needs to just go she got to go to jamaica and she i think that's yeah. enough there's yeah i was about to yeah, say that, that, that that's, that's the that's the end of and, story uh it, it she just needs and i think she's gonna find her 
Mitchell Moncrief. It might not have got to the Mitchells till they hit the land here on, on this mainland here, but there's definitely the Moncrief line coming out of Jamaica, coming into America. So she might not have a hard time finding what she's looking for. She's just going to have to do it. It's, it's just time to do it. It's just, there's a lot of stuff out here. So apparently these Moncrief's have some money too. Well, because they own the patio. <laughs> oh no, that's oh, modern I'm day. First time. Time. One more time. I'm back in the 1790s, and and actually on that website is also, like I said, there's this little obit and it ties to to the West Indies and all this other stuff. And I don't know what called to the bar means unless he was an attorney, the mm -hmm. Peter Moncrief. Uh, yes. And, you know, he either became an attorney or whatever in 1837. She's got some rich history to start digging in. All right. Anything else about these Moncrief? No, nope, we moving move on. on to current events. Yeah, current events. <laughs> current it. events. It's so you... rare. To... <laughs> Don't start. It is Shall rare. We... <laughs> oh, goodness. I just want to remind everybody don't forget if you submit an Ask Mariah query during the month of November, you get a chance to win a free four day pass to Roots Tech taking place February 28th to March 3rd, 2018 in Salt Lake City, Utah. So if you saw what we talked about tonight, you want some help with your genealogy research, submit for Ask Mariah and maybe you will be the person that may just win that pass to Roots Tech. In terms of current events, we're gonna cover this quickly because I know everybody's gonna start fussing, but boy, <laughs> oh boy, did Kevin Levin Go in on I find your roots, this. Lord, today. So let me just go ahead and give a brief recap. So Kevin Levin, if you don't know who he is, he is a Civil War historian, educator, awesome. And he's one of the people who has continually busted down the, <laughs> the Confederate veteran, Black Confederate veteran myth. And uh, he posted last night, and it was actually, he actually tweeted Henry Louis Gates, and it was a video of what was being aired with Brian Gumbel on last night's episode of Finding Your Roots. And he talked about how uh, he had encountered Dr. Gates before and basically reiterated the fact that this whole idea of Black Confederates is very irresponsible, all this stuff. So after the episode aired last night, Kevin set off to his blog and was like, look, it's, I'm, you're just, I'm not about that life. And he basically says that it's a common mistake that people fall back on the Black Confederate myth. It's true that men in the Louisiana Native, Louisiana Native Guard pledged their loyalty to the Confederacy. And as Gates suggests, many of these free Blacks may have done so to protect their economic interests. But again, they were never accepted into the Confederate Army. I'm going to repeat that one more time. They were never accepted into the Confederate Army. The reason is because the Confederate government refused to accept black men into the service until the final weeks of the war. That's why black Confederates don't really exist. If somebody was a cook, if they were a body servant, they weren't actually holding a gun in battle doing anything. OK, so he posted this blog last night and the bottom portion was what was there. Then this morning, <laughs> this morning, <laughs> Kevin went back. And he added this little yellow box at the top. And I'm going to zoom in so you can see. Let me see if I can zoom in. Oh, no, I don't think I can, but I'll just read it. It says, update. Early on in the production of this episode, meaning last night's episode of Finding a Roots that was called Black Like Me. <laughs> <laughs> the, a producer with Finding a Roots researched or reached out to a reputable historian about the ongoing research into the into Martin Lamott, who was the ancestor of Brian Gumbel. In an email exchange that I have seen, the producer was told specifically that the Louisiana Native Guard was never accepted into service by the Confederate government. This raises important questions about the integrity of the program's research process. So here we are again, back to this issue that we dealt with last season yeah. with regard to Ben Affleck, right? The whole reason yep. we found out about it was because of the Sony email hack. And now we're back here again. 
How do you feel about that? We should that? not be back here again. We, we should not be here again. And, and I posted also on Facebook, we have to look to the researchers that are providing this information that Mr. Gates is sitting up there talking about. They, somebody needs to get checked at that point. I know some of those folks. And, and again, I question what they're presenting and giving us, but Gates is going to, is caught in there. And I'm not saying he don't know. He's not a researcher. That's, that's not his J O B. He <laughs> needs to start checking and either passing checks to another person because there's definitely an issue. We should not be back at this again. And every time we hit these episodes that us, little old us, researchers 20, 30 years, just like <laughs> the people get paid, you know, and we should not be disputing this. They need to either put the facts up there or stop doing the show well, because well, it makes it bad Here's, for the, here's us. something that I have to interject with because you bring up a great point about them having screening. Well, one of the responses to last season was to have a person vet the information that was going to be yes. aired. You remember that, right? <laughs> yeah, that was should. one of the stipulations was that they were going to have somebody yes. who was mm -hmm. going to vet the research and, mm -hmm. you know, do all that other kind of stuff. So so this apparently ap appeared to have gone, still gone through that blockade. Well, well, I, I am about ready to launch a, what is it, a, a change.org? <laughs> survey because it, there's a certain level of sloppiness we're talking about whether it's uh slave schedule sloppiness or mm -hmm. or just rare this, this rare <laughs> or this blanket blanket comments that he makes and again you know he's promoting a show genealogy is big business so my thing is when we see stuff like that mr levin shouldn't be the only one tweeting out how irresponsible this is I think the genealogy community needs to go out and go hard and say this is unacceptable. The nail on the head. It's big business. And yeah. he's selling money, his money, money. business. That's right. It's, it's corporate funding. But, okay. We remember, uh, was it two years ago, uh, or year before last, when Josh Taylor made a statement about people having their names changed at Ellis Island, and the genealogist came in like, Yes. Hornets. And said, so, oh, no, this didn't happen. No, 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 no. I mean, from all over the place. No, they didn't. This didn't happen. This is wrong, 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 wrong. Interestingly, uh, and, and really, Kevin Levin has been incredible um, in terms yeah. of staying on it. Today, I was posting uh, on Facebook uh, with several people the thread that appeared on Twitter and um, even stronger than the language that was in his blog in terms of, you know, well, look, PBS, you know, you have a platform here. The danger of sometimes saying things flippantly, uh, especially when you're talking about issues of race, even though there are people politically who still want to talk about the Civil War, oh, it wasn't about slavery at all, right. But the fact is that now, what, neo-Confederates are now going to be saying, hey, this professor at Harvard said, you know, hey, there were black Confederates. And this is a very, very dangerous, dangerous myth. Um, and he's suddenly gotten these strange bedfellows by speaking um, so flippantly. But again, we're talking also on the fact that many people don't get their education from any other resource other than something that is televised. And as a result, oh, wow, you know, they're hearing this information and it came from PBS. And we know what PBS represents. And, you know, where are those fact checkers or how much influence do they have on that program? Yeah. Um, uh, the lady in, whose ancestors are from the Algonquin community of the native people from the Illinois Basin, do you know how rare that is for African Americans to actually be able to document? And you know I had a reaction to that. Well, we both had a reaction to that. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, well, what is our but what is our you know, responsibility? I think we need to hold them accountable and say, you said we're back when Ben Affleck you know, was trying to hide this stuff, you were going to do this. And you haven't because he's still out there promoting 
sketchy research, and it is sketchy. Oh. I, I think we it's I think the genealogy was told. Yeah, well, yeah, but, 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 but we need to call him out every time he does this. We need the, the, we there are power in numbers. If enough of us call him out, they're going to have to respond to that. But that's the thing. Who really cares about this besides people of color? Mm -hmm. And who really because, cares? Because hold on, for hold on. Let me finish. Let me finish. Mm -hmm. The reason why I bring that up is because think about i mean and and i don't i'm trying to think of of where this conversation uh happened but i know ellen actually shared uh a thread of tweets from someone right. who is sort of like a uh a, a, a historian that that specializes in the whole irish slave myth thing and and really unearthing that story and like telling mm -hmm. people no you're wrong blah 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 and one of the things that that he mentioned was that part of the propaganda that was sent out by the russians yes his name is liam hogan liam Hogan. um part of the propaganda that was sent out by the russians was trying to perpetuate this yeah. irish slave myth myth right in right. terms of this election stuff that was sent out falsely that 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 really misled Mm -hmm. You know our communities. Think about the 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 you know the thousands of ads that were 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 done. The millions of people that saw these things. And right. I bring that up because we're at a very pivotal time now, mm -hmm. um, relations wise. Let's not even talk about race. Just relations wise between people, where we're having these, we're rehashing these debates that that should have been not have to be rehashed, right? And exactly. a lot of it is because people. Yes, you should question history, but the whole notion of the truth and what the facts say right. is constantly under attack. So that's one of the reasons why I feel like if if the mantle gets taken up to to um, pursue this, it needs to be from a cultural, not historical, mm -hmm. but from a cultural, a potentially dangerous cultural uh, reaction to this. This to me could be likened because of the millions of people who watch the show. There's a potential that this could be likened to something like the the uh, the myth in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, about, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it basically could be that. Or... Well, well, you know, just yeah, the, the happy uh, the slave lost or cause. the good master, the yeah. lost cause, the <laughs> they were to their slaves. I mean, people I mean, are hungry the for the trajectory with that. But the but the larger question is, who cares about this? besides the people who watch this show who cares well, i think it? that that part of the discussion has to be of course many of us are going to have a certain kind of reaction but i would think genealogists themselves as well and i am very concerned with the historians kevin levin is fighting like a one-man battle other than those of us who are behind him retweeting mm -hmm. what he's been doing but i didn't see too many other genealogists whom I know retweeting him, but and my circle is a small circle. But the point is that as researchers, I would hope that librarians have a concern. You know, we, there are the, the royalty, that we know who the royalty in the genealogy world are. They are silent all the time on yes. certain issues, especially, they are always silent from his majesty, her majesty, whomever, put the name in the spot, but they are totally, <laughs> totally silent. Totally. Well, I, I, I would choose. So I it looks would. like, oh, this handful of folks. But <laughs> as solid researchers, you know, we'll talk about uh, a certain standard to which we adhere, but they're silent when a slave schedule with no name is used, but yet, you know, the people who speak to the proof standard have nothing to say. Mm -hmm. Is, you're having nothing to say because it's a slave schedule? Would you have something to say if it were, um, uh, you know, a, a, another type of roster where the names are missing? Mm -hmm. Is it because the people being reflected are people of color? Or help me understand this. And their silence is as loud as the silence of people who stand by while someone's being abused in front of the crowd, and the crowd just watches. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and yeah, it saddens me a great deal. And I Ellen. hope that others will start to respond. I, I think there's too many people who, who stand up and say, that's that's not my history. And yeah. we're here trying to say, yo, get, get back here. I got something to talk to you about. Or yeah, they yeah. just keep walking. 
Um, it, one of the things that I find really disturbing about the show is that they're using it also for educating kids. So then like, yeah. how much of this segment of this program is going to be repeated to those sixth graders that they have in those sheets? And I also noticed the funding, there's hardly any kind of public funding. I mean, yeah. Uh, PBS. Corporation. The other issue is PBS, you know, and how they're they're funding. Why do we have such a list of corporations there? And I'm not saying that corporations are inherently evil, but we're also seeing the pullback by the government on funding any access to educate real educational materials that gonna make a difference to a lot of people. And I think that's part of part of the pivot. That's part of our frustration. Um, the other thing is like the the risk of silencing and speak being speaking out, you know. Like uh, people aren't really, I, I don't know what uh, Kevin's situation is, but if he was at a university, he might have to speak to somebody because he spoke right. out and he would not even have the freedom to put that message out there. Then mm -hmm. you've got tourism. I mean, there's so mm -hmm. many different angles to all of this. And, um, and in the end, people of color get shortchanged. I mean, I can't tell you how many times it's so frustrating to sit through the show and hear like, oh, it's so rare. Or like, oh, a black person with native ancestry, really? And then uh, Puerto Ricans, no, Puerto Ricans, oh, did you know the Tainos are extinct? I mean, come on, give me a break, you know? There's no native people in the Caribbean, according to this show. So, I, yes. and, and that swaths of New England are empty. So when these people show up, they just get this land. I mean, in, in, and it's inadvertent. I know you can't pack everything into this show, but dang, you gotta, you gotta step it up a little bit, you know? This is not enough. All right, Maybe the Melissa. stakes are high. Melissa? Oh, me. Um, I agree with everything everybody is saying. <laughs> and, you know, when he when he kept looking at that newspaper article, you know, that it, it, uh, showed his Lamont in there saying that he signed off on this and everything. And, and Gumbel was saying, oh, no, 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 this couldn't be. And Gates was saying, oh, yes, yes, yes. And I was thinking, how do you know? You weren't there. How do you know? Um, no. You don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. I guess because he was told that is his signature. That and someone told him that. Because I mean he is the he's the host. The host doesn't go out into the trenches and do the research. So his team or whomever, you know, gave him a certain amount of facts. And um, he may make certain statements. Uh, I think some of us are reacting maybe to some of the, uh, what is it, Shannon, called it the puffery? <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. I think yes. The heights, the heights, um, the heights of puffery. The heights of puffery. <laughs> it was the heights of puffery. puffery. That's what he said. <laughs> I, that was a great term. I guess, I guess the concern is that, oh my gosh, look how unique you are. Because there was sort of that, you know, you're part of the elite. You are the talented 10th. You are, you know, you're very special. Mm -hmm. You are rare. Now, how rare is it for anyone with deep roots in New Orleans to find that an ancestor, oh yes, one ancestor actually had another family on the side. Girl, <laughs> look, I mean, that's the whole okay, system of massage. <laughs> go, go look up massage. If that's you don't know what massage is, just, don't even put the little squiggly little line. Just put massage in Google. You know, I mean, <laughs> that was Kate River was about that. Okay, um, I mean, I look at, at some of the things and I hear them, and oh yes, your folks from the Illinois Basin, you are rare. And then how does it feel to be so rare? First of all, she's not that rare. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, unfortunately, maybe you don't know those of us who do um, look at some of the records that are not so rare. 14,000 is not rare. Um, and of course, hundreds of thousands of descendants from those 14,000. Right. But it's, it's, I guess, the, um, it's television, and we have to understand that. It's for entertainment. But many people won't. They're going to take misinformation, possible truth, and uh, that's how misconceptions start. So, and, well, and, I, and I, Kevin, my question is, how do we anyway. get? So, how do we get those folks that we know? How do we get them to care? Because right now, you know, and and when the when the slave schedules thing happened a couple of weeks ago, I actually took the time and went and took a just a random 
yeah. shipped manifest from uh from Ellis Island and photoshopped all the names off. Yeah. Kept all the details, but photoshopped mm-hmm. all the names off. And I said, is it would this convey to people the impact of that document? Don't mess with they, Ellis Island. You that's gotta what put I'm it saying. in sepia first. That's though. my point. <laughs> You know, Don't but, but that's what Ellis Island. But but that's why, what but, I mentioned but, in that chat on Chit yeah. Chat Live, and and I asked the two hosts, would you show this to a client if this slot, if this this sheet of list of names is empty? They said absolutely not. You cannot. But the, do but that. how do we get how do we get other people to care? That's the bottom line. Is we as a we community of people it. of color, ge- genealogists, how do we get? other people to care about this and see how dangerous this is, especially in the climate that we're in right now with the way that, that misinformation is being shared and, and, and just being spouted out. And, you know, a lot of these tech companies, it's not in their best interest to shut down the sharing because that means that people are interacting with their stuff, with their websites less. Mm -hmm. So how do we get, everybody on the same page to understand that if this was a situation where, like I said, Ellis Island, something, something that is unique to the United States and the immigrant European immigrant experience was botched, you know, where we would get behind other people that we know and say, Hey, no, this is, you know, ethically, this is not okay. How do we get those other people to join, to join us? And maybe we can't answer that question tonight. If you're watching and you have an idea, you know, outside of tweeting, outside of change.org petitions, whatever it is, because this is, this has, this is really, has really nothing to do with the Confederacy as everything in the world to do with ethics and, and our cultural history and how it's being presented. And it could go any way. And, with and any have, of the guests. You have to think there's certain moments when genealogy has this moral compass and it's pointing mm-hmm. in the wrong direction. It mm-hmm. happened with eugenics, mm-hmm. which is at the base yeah. of genealogy mm-hmm. and paired with that. Right. And people really need That's to know, be excellent. aware of this kind of history, this kind of historical, not that people are necessarily doing it now, but there are groups of people now trying to do this yes. same kind of thing, you know, in a slightly different package, you know? That's an excellent point. But you know, it impacts those of us that professionally do this. When this is coming, and I posted this on Facebook, clients and things that we have are going to expect these things that they're seeing on TV. They're they're believing it. Kevin Levin talked about the ethical responsibility that PBS has, mm -hmm. and as well as Gate, when he when he pretty much allows this to happen regular, regardless if he knows it or not, he, mm-hmm. he's saying it, he's mm-hmm. taking what they're giving him and mm-hmm. those producers are forming that show. It's not totally gate. There's no. a team of producers that are, are sending this message out incorrectly, falsely, which is almost hampering what we all do as professional genealogists, it's going to hamper and impact what mm-hmm. we do because that uh-huh. slave schedule and mm-hmm. everything else that they're saying in the rareness or what they're saying, that is your Confederate, whatever. They're well, we all have to do a book that. of life. Yeah. yeah I, they're going to expect <laughs> that. That lack of trust is huge with the integrity of what we do. I, and I Yeah. I think Shelly brings up a great point about, having integrity behind the product that you're producing. I think, yeah. you know, Ellen's tied to the history of genealogy being tied to eugenics and, and that whole piece. Yeah. If you I missed so um, Ellen, Ellen laid, she laid, but there was no edge left behind. Uh, when we, <laughs> she, when we pulled, Ooh, who? Yes, last year. Oh, was, you could hear the silence when I posted that blog. <laughs> it was utter silence. It was if you have silent. not, if you have not read Ellen's, I mean, very eloquent blog post that she wrote, where she tied the, the history of genealogy to eugenics and how that is inherently that. racist and yeah. how that dictates yeah. what we see happening in our community even now 
yeah. please feel free to check that out because that blog mm -hmm. post was yeah. just, it was excellent. And I think it tied in well with the history of NGS and how we unearthed that article yes. that talked about how they mm -hmm. segregated it. And I mean, it just totally fed and, in and there. And it's but, not even just eugenics. I mean, if you look at Latino genealogy, there's these like these volumes and they were, uh, you have to look at when things were published. There's a lot of stuff that came out of the Franco era which is like they oh. legitimized genealogy yeah. because it would enforce their positions. These were people right. who were stealing people's babies, shooting people in the streets and they're fascists, mm -hmm. you know? And they mm -hmm. use genealogy mm -hmm. to elevate themselves. So if right. we get these books and we don't know this context, what the heck are we really looking at? Because you know that you can pay somebody and they can, They'll crank out whatever you want they to They can pay somebody to be white. Do you remember that? Exactly. I was just about to say, y'all taught me about paying to be white. All paying to be white. <laughs> That's right. Honey, <laughs> <laughs> I can't mean to. Yes. This and in Oklahoma, we call it the $5 Indians. There what you go. go. Come on now. Come on now. This was a really good discussion, hey. you guys. But yeah, I think, um, <laughs> I think uh, that There's I think this come. is great. Yeah, this there's more to come. And I think, I think we as a community regardless of if you're a person of color, whatever, we all need to get behind this because this yeah. this is really, you know, our kids, everybody's looking at this and this is the this is the uh the lost cause, potentially the lost cause well, again. It's also the struggle for ethnic studies. I mean how many states have tried to pull ethnic studies and that's one of the full, few places that you can get a different history. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean wow. all of these things have so many you know, think so about, much potential. Think about the money that's being made Ugh. at Ancestry and DNA. Just, yeah. just that segment, not even mm -hmm. the memberships, but they're going to connect. Yeah. And there's over five or six million people doing the DNA right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're looking for something. We're all yeah. looking for something. And, but you want to let the evidence tell that story that's factual and right. i again what they're produced i love the show i love the opportunity to see that i don't want it to go away but i want it to be right right and tell the yeah. truth and yes i understand they're going to cut this that and the other but what comes out there should walk the plank and be mm -hmm. on the right side of history not be and on if they the don't wrong know, side of history and if they don't know the truth they don't need to air it Exactly. But I still go back to the researchers and who are doing that. And I know it's Johnny Cerny and her team. And again, how much African American research have they actually done? Or is it just pulling this stuff offline? Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. Well, I'm sure they do a certain amount. They've got the Family History Center right mm -hmm. there. And, and how much do they do? and actual oh. African-American history research so. in the documents. Right. I, and, I, and I think that yeah. that's like testimony, Shelley, to like what you bring to the table, you know, who's, yeah. who's actually doing that work. Yes. And yes. It's, it's, a, it's a whole nother thing to, to speak from that place. The research okay, is also one sorry. thing. The script <laughs> is another thing. The script. Huh? So we yeah, don't the know producers the is. in the script. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gates is yeah. sitting there reading what's putting in front of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So anyway, Miss right. Nika. So I don't I think know. he's going to come on our show though. <laughs> I doubt it. Well, I think uh, we need to. I think we need to invite him, and I'll send that message out. Well, I think hey, he needs see. to come to Black Pro Gen Live. Well, Face hey. your accusers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my Witness goodness. Well, if you okay. haven't caught the blog post, it's called The Genealogy of Genealogy. This is on Ellen's blog and it's um it comes yeah. from the vantage point of uh roots and honey, she she there's no oh, edge left behind. It is so good. It's excellent. Oh, it is you. excellent and it's sourced and it is just Ellen just put her foot all up in <laughs> and I'm to reread this. Yes, we need to reread this I'm right now. All right, so Yes, but next week, let me tell you guys, it is going all the way down. You do not 
want to miss the next episode of Black Pro Gen Live. Why? Because we are going to be talking about the freedmen of the five civilized tribes. We're talking about the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, and Creek, who are revered groups of First Nations people who also have a complicated history that involves chattel slavery. You're going to learn about critical record sets when researching these groups and the complex relationships they have with their freedmen. Do not miss tuning into Black Pro Gen Live next Wednesday, which is uh, November 15th. Me and Angela are going to be holding court. You're going to get past the Dawes rolls because that is barely cracking the surface when, it talk, when we're talking about this community of people. We have receipts for days. This literally could be a seven hour webinar if we really wanted it to. There's almost it's almost impossible to talk about this in an hour, but we are gonna make sure that we give our people justice. Um and you know, quit the myth of, oh, this is so rare. No. Um and also <laughs> and also address the fact that, you know, you may have a tie to the nation, it to some of these nations, and it may not be by blood, it may be through slavery. It probably yeah. is through slavery. Don't dismiss that. Don't think that that's not as important. Um, so, so please be sure to, to tune in next week for Black Pro Gen Live. We're going to talk about the freedom of the five civilized tribes. Following that, our last episode for the year 2017 is taking place on Wednesday, November 29th. It was originally scheduled for Tuesday, but I got the football banquet and I'm not missing that. So, <laughs> so it's going to be Wednesday. Uh, and it's called Pad and My Pen, Writing Your Family History in Honor of National Novel Writing Month, NaNoWriMo, which is taking place right now. Mm -hmm. Join us for the last episode of the 2017 season of Black Pro Gen Live, where we discuss transforming your family history research into a creative literary project. We're going to have a special guest, Anita Henderson, is going to be joining us. And uh, be sure to join us uh, for the last episode on on Wednesday, November 29th, 2017. Don't forget also to check out the next episode of Research at the National Archives and Beyond, Blog Talk Radio with Bernice Bennett, who of course was on hiatus with us tonight because it's her husband's birthday. Happy birthday, Mr. Bennett. Uh, <laughs> Bernice's next show is going to be on writing the accountability partner with who I just talked about. Anita Henderson, <laughs> a hot topic, right? And Christine Easterling, we have the most recent iteration of the African Roots podcast that was just posted on November 1st, 2017. Be sure to check out her new little look on her, on her blog because it's yes, looking nice and cute. Look. It looks nice. <laughs> Thanks to someone whom we all know and love, Ms. Nika Sewell Smith. <laughs> thank, thank you, Nika, for doing that. No yeah. problem. Miss Angela can't stand WordPress, but I'm working on her. I'm working oh, on her. I hate that. All right. I hate that platform. What can I do? I know. She does. She does. She's got uh, red on. She does have red on in yeah. her picture. So it's Bernice. Okay. So uh, don't also for, don't forget about Mondays with Mert and Wacky Wednesday with our friend, Dear Myrtle. Also, don't forget to subscribe to The Lowdown. Get the latest and greatest from Black Pro Gen in your inbox. Subscribe to The Lowdown today. Check the description of this recording and any Black Pro Gen Live episode for the link to subscribe to The Lowdown. And you know what? Did we say something that bothered you? Are you mad that we kept saying rare over and over and over again? <laughs> <laughs> Join the conversation. Tweet us at Black Progen. Use the hashtag Black Progen. And you know that the chat has been awesome. We've got some great feedback tonight. Um, Karen Royal and Karen Galloway are driving me crazy because they're over here talking about Point Coupee, and that's my people. And I can't be in the conversation in Louisiana and talking about how Bryant Gumbel's family has a tie there. And they didn't mention that last night. They just went straight to New Orleans. Anywho, but uh, we've got great comment um, from uh, from people uh, like James Winder. He says, thank you, ladies. Great show. Uh, Gerard Miller says he's excited about next week. He's reportedly Eastern Cherokee. No roles we know of. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about that Eastern Cherokee. <laughs> I'm glad. 90,000 miles. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Don't start shelling. Let me, let me eject her for show. Just, you guys need to straighten that mess out next week. Well, you know, that's the thing. Like I said, we're going to take an intermediate approach because okay. there are plenty of webinars that people can access. Angela has done them. <laughs> um, they are on Legacy's website. I that went you through her the course. <laughs> the basic, exactly, the basic ground floor level yes. stuff for freedmen. But we want to really talk about their story within the yes. territory and then the after that happened once um, the trees were signed in Oklahoma and, you know, became a state and just that whole history. There's so much there. It's, it's more than blood quantums. 
that's what people really sort of distill it down to is a blood yeah. quantum. And it's so much more than that. Um, oh, in yeah. fact, I've gotten back to fifth grade grandparents, not all my people who were living in the United States, but folks who were living in Indian territory. Uh, so don't please don't forget to miss that episode. But yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank I know you. we ran over. I, I and they talk about how they asked Mariah goes too long, but they sure were talking. <laughs> but ask Mariah, <laughs> so I don't want to hear nothing from any of y'all. That's the best part. Yeah, it's the best part of the show. But we want to thank Melissa Barker for hanging out with us for the whole evening, participating in Ask Mariah, telling Jennifer she needs to get her tail to Jamaica, but telling <laughs> us about the archives and how you need to call ahead of time and all sorts of other stuff. Thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us and for being oh, one, of our, for one of our me. awesome viewers. Yes, Come and don't again. forget to... Yeah, don't forget to join us. Remember, next week, Wednesday, and then after Thanksgiving, the last Wednesday of the month, that's it for 2017. We've got oh. most of the topics figured out for 2018, but if you want to try to slide some more through that you think we should be interested in, uh, definitely let us know. So we will see you next Wednesday. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.